Hello, welcome to the Learner Tree Reading Fair, day three. And we are reading uh, two hours, 10 days on the weekdays. Uh, we have a, a suggestion of reading or people can read whatever they have at, at home in front of their computer. And I'm Meredith McGee in Jackson, Mississippi. Hello everyone, my name is Talia Hines. I am 11 years old, I'm in the fifth grade and I go to Dean Smith Elementary School. And I'm also a member of Miss Middle of Learning. Yeah. Hello, my name is Talia Hines. I'm 11 years old, I'm in the fifth grade and I go to Dean Smith Elementary School. And I'm also a member of Miss Middle of Learning. Yeah. Hello, everybody. It's so good to be here with you today and to be with Community Library of Mississippi. I am Janice K. Hill Vincent, a writer who is part of this Community Library of Mississippi gathering, sharing my poetry. I do have a poetry book that is entitled A Little of Me, A Little of You, Spoken Word Choir Book. And of course, I have a paperback as well as a hardback. And you will learn more about it as we continue. Janice K. Neal Vincent, I'm from Madison, Mississippi. Thank you. And you know, we have a, a suggestion. We can listen your uh, books on that. And I can't wait to see your spoken word choir in February because we get to set a stage book for the Jackson Book Festival. <laughs> And uh, Tanya, yes, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, did you get to see her spoken word choir at the Jackson Medical Mall two years ago? Was you there? Oh, well, maybe you'll get to see it this year. We, uh, she did it in February of 2020. Oh, she's going to do it in February of 2023. And, that's how, and, and I want her to be in it. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. She wants you in it. Okay. <laughs> Yes. yes, I have to contact her mother. <laughs> yes, oh man, that's you. You gonna love it. I, it. It's just a beautiful thing to see a spoken word choir, which is people speaking poetry together. Uh, can you explain it to her? Oh yes, yes. A spoken word choir operates similar to a singing choir. We are all very familiar with how a singing choir goes and we join in as audiences with what they're singing because they are singing some of our favorite songs. So when we look at a spoken word choir, the spoken word choir takes the poem because after all a song is but a poem, takes the poem that someone has written and expresses it together. Just as the singing choir has different voices, like light, medium, dark, so does the spoken word choir, light, medium, dark. When we look at the singing voices, we would associate those voices I called out with soprano, alto, bass, even tenor. And so the voices are classified according to those persons who fit within. So if I'm a soprano in the spoken word choir, I am a light voice. If I'm an alto in the spoken word choir as a speaker within that, I am medium. If I am bass in the singing choir, then in the spoken word choir, I become a dark voice. And so it's all about the folks getting together, understanding that particular poem that the director is directing, and they say it accordingly. They say it with meaning. What does the poem mean? And if I were to piggyback on something that Professor Emerita Charlotte Lee said, 
at Northwestern University many years ago. A poem does not mean but be. In other words, the poem exists and lives on its own. So the poem comes to life when the spoken word choir speaks it. There may be a leader, the one who has certain lines to say. There may be a chorus, like the all, everybody else. All of those persons are backing up the leader, just as it would be with the singing group. And so it goes on. As you know, there are so many poems. And of course, I contribute to so many in my spoken word choir book. A little of me, a little of you. Because these poems in here are about all of us, no matter where we come from, no matter how old or how young we are. That's what a spoken word choir is all about. We are coming together, coming together. Yes, we have unity one to the other as we are saying that poem. What makes it good to be sad is that the director is leading the choir accordingly. And so the director uses hands and facial expressions and voice to allow the choir to get involved with her. In, that, in this case, it's me, the spoken word choir director, Janice K. Neal Vincent. <laughs> Thank you, Janice, for that. Okay. Um, Thank you. Talia, are, are you ready to start um, reading chapter three? And oh, show, tell us the name of the book and hold it up again. Um, Judy B. Jones and the Mini Jim Birthday. Judy B. Jones and the Mini. Jim's birthday. birthday. Okay. I get it. Chapter three. I walk home from the bus stop very slumpy. Very slumpy is when your shoulders are sad and your head can't hold can't hold up that good. Grandma Miller was in the nursery. She's babysitting me and my baby brother in the afternoon. His name is Oliver. I love I love him at a real real lot, except I wish he didn't live at my actually house. Grandma Miller was rocking him into the rocking chair. I tried to climb up there too. Only grandma said, hold your horses at me. Yeah, only I need only I need to rock very bad. I explained, on my account of a mean boy is having a birthday party on Saturday, and he is inviting everyone in room nine, but only not me. I'm the only one who's not going. Grandma Miller did a sad face. Children can be so cruel, she said. Just wait until I get the baby to sleep, and then you... And then you and I will talk about it, okay? And so they had come, and I had crossed my arms, and I trapped my foot. And I waited and waited for the baby to go to sleep. Only his eyes kept on, kept on staying wide open. Hold them close with your fingers, Grandma, I told her. Heavens no, she said. She, then she kept right on rocking him. And so finally I got tired, tired of waiting. And I went to my room and I crawled underneath my cover. I crawled the way down to the bottom of my sheet. It is very must fluffy down there. You can't you can't say mean stuff and no one can hear you. Here is all the stuff I hate, I said. 
first I hate the mini gym, then I hate clowns, and old Madonna had a form. Plus, I hate rabbits and brunos and ponies. And guess what else? We didn't actually need a baby at this house. Only no one even confessed me. Just then, I heard a knock on my door. Judy B, it's grandma, honey. I look finally went to sleep. She came in and lift up my cover. I called your mother and told her what happened at school, she said. I peeked up at her. And so can she fix it? I asked. Can I go to the birthday party now? Grandma really held her arm to me. She pulled me out, out of my cover. Your mother is going to talk to you about it when she gets home, she said. Meanwhile, why don't you and I have a little fun? Let's read a book, okay? What kind of stories would you like to hear? I thought and thought. I would like to hear a story about a little girl who doesn't get invited to a mean boy's birthday. And so she sneaks to his house and she lets a wild pony out of the barn. And then it spots it the boy into a finic pancake. And all the children pour male syrup on the guy. Male syrup at the guy. And they eat him for breakfast. Grandma Miller looked kind of sickish. You got to stop worrying about that boy party. He's just trying to get your goat, she said. Just then, my eyes got big and wide at her. Goat? What goat, Grandma? Do I have a goat? It's a surprise goat. Are you keeping it a secret? At our at your house, I jump up and pull her hand. Let's go get it. I want to, Grandma. Let's go get my goat right now. Just then, a great idea popped in my head. Hey, I just thought of something, Grandma. You and me can bring my goat to my house, and then I can have my very own birthday on. Saturday, I will call it come and pet my goat. And everyone in everyone in Rona will come to my birthday and they won't go to the mean gyms. All of a sudden, the front door opened. It, it, it's mother. I ran to her speed quick. Mother, mother, guess what? Guess what? Me and Grandma Bella are getting my goat. And I have my very own birthday party on Saturday. And all of room nine is going to be invited. Only not that gym I hate. He's the only one that's not coming. So ha, ha, ha on him. Just then, Grandma Mother sneaked out the front door with her sweater. I pulled on my mother's arm. Come on, mother. Come on, I said. We have to go to the store and buy my invitations. Plus, also, we have to pick up the penny winnie. Mother didn't come. She sat down on the couch and smooched and smoothed my hair. Listen to me, B. Jones, she said. I know Jim hurt your feelings today, but you can't have your birthday party on Saturday. Your birthday isn't until June, remember? And June is still a month away. I know June is a month away, I said. And so that is how come I am I am moving my birthday sweater. Cause months all cause months away will be too late. Mothers pick up and pick up me on her lap. I am afraid you don't understand, honey, she said. You just can't change you just can't change the day you were born. No one can. It's impossible. I made my voice very whisper. Yeah, only hear a little secret. Nobody in not in nine and room nine even knows when my birthday is. So I think we can pull it off. Mother did a little smile. She rough my hair. Sorry, honey. No, you no, you can no, you do, she said. Yes, I own it. Yes, yes, can do, cause I have 
because I have to have my birthday on Saturday or else I will be the only one who is not going to to that mean gems and that is the saddest story I ever heard of. Just then, my eyes got a little bit of wet in them. Mother wiped my face with a tissue. Then she hugged me really tight and said the word, I'm sorry. More bad news. Grandma Miller just called. And so good. Chapter four, moving. The next morning, I didn't, didn't get out of my bed. Not even when mother holler time for breakfast she came into my room did you hear me judy b it's time to eat she said i looked under my pillow yeah only i'm not even hungry plus also i'm moving today i said mother smiled she sat on my bed you're moving huh she said and actually where will where will be going i didn't I did my shoulders up and down. Somewhere, I said. Somewhere? Where? She asked. Somewhere, not here. There, that where? I said. Mother hugged me. This is still about Jen's birthday party, isn't it? She said. You're worried about not getting an invitation. No, I'm not, I said. On account of I'm not even going to the school anymore. No account, on account of my moving today. Mother shook her head. Then she went out of my room and she and daddy did whisper in the hall. Pretty sure daddy came in. He gave me a piggyback ride to the kitchen. Then mother made my favorite hot cereal. Weird. And she left me having all the brown sugar I want. She sat down next to me. You know, Judy B, Jim is not only doing this to hurt your feelings, she said. He just wants to get a reaction from, uh, from you. That's all. Sure he does, said Daddy. And then someone is trying to hurt your feelings. There's only one way to get back at them. You have to pretend you don't care said mother you have to pretend you don't even want to go to that party because it, if you pretend you don't want to go it will take all the fun out of it from, from him daddy wink you can do that can you he said he asked you're the you're the little pretender in the entire world just then my whole face light up because the word gave me a great idea. Hey, I just figured out where I where I can move to. It called it a small world after. So if right now, I'm going to start right there and finish the rest tomorrow. Oh, no, we, we got, you got the time to have uh, several more times. So we have, uh, we still have an hour left to read. So you you have at least one or two more times to read. Okay. Okay. Um, what page are you on? Um, I just got done with twenty nine. About to be on thirty. Okay, and I'm starting on uh twenty, and um, I'm with. This is the third day I've been reading this book. As brave, brave, and as by Jason Reynolds. I don't know if I'll be able to finish it <laughs> at the end. I should have picked a smaller book. But anyway, this is a, 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 a children's chapter book. It's 410 or so pages. Okay. After the lineup, Grandma herded them up a set of stairs. Wait, I think I read that yesterday. Let me see what I wrote. Ernie, Jenny. Ernie is the older brother, then Jenny, Ma, and Dad. All in one room, with two big old beds. Ma and Dad tucked out quick. No surprise, since they had been driving all night. Ernie fell asleep right after them. 
because, well, he just never had a problem sleeping. <laughs> it didn't matter. It was in a car or in a strange house. Ernie was going to find a way to catch Z's, but not Jenny. He couldn't get comfortable. He wasn't in his bed or his house or even his city. He just lay still in the dark on a mattress that <laughs> stink of sad old socks. A mattress so thin he could feel the springs in his back, like lying on a bed of fish. And to make it even weirder, it was crazy quiet. No police sirens, no loud music. No couples arguing outside his window on the street. No hungry cats whose meows for some reason always sounded like babies crying. Only sound besides Ernie snoring was about a million crickets and a million frogs playing feet and repeat with the crickets. No way was he going, gonna ever get sleep. No way. When morning came, along with the brightest sunlight ever and the smell of eggs and bacon coming through the cracks in the wooden floor, mixed with the smell of Ernie's thick toe, which was way too close to Jenny's nose, Jenny woke up. So he must have fallen asleep after all. Ma was already up. The bed she and dad had slept in already made as if they had never been in it. And the end of the colorful blanket was tightly trapped between Ma's chin and chest as she folded the bottom. She taught Jenny how to fold like that at home. He still hadn't gotten it down, but she was a master. Good morning. She sings song, making one more fold, then settling the blanket on the edge of the bed. A perfect rectangle. Sleep okay? Jenny, <laughs> noticing the bags under her mother's eyes, wanted to ask her the same question, but instead just nodded and slipped out from under. Bernie's leg. He thought Ernie was asleep, but then he felt his brother shaking from giggling. Hey, Jenny. <laughs> what, what my toe smell like? <laughs> then he busted out laughing from beneath the cover. <laughs> smell like your butt, Jenny. <laughs> my step. He sat up just as Ernie tried to shove him off the bed with his feet. Stop, Jenny said, pushing back, <laughs> trying not to fall. Ernie cut it out. It's too early for this mom worn. What? I'm just playing with him. Ernie reached for his sunglasses, which he had set carefully on the floor beside the bed the night before. Mom, Gave him the, don't you dare look. Come on, Ma. It's stupid bright in here. He's, he protested, sliding the shades on. <laughs> the windows didn't have curtains or blinds, so the sun just poured in. It bounced off the floor, wood floor, and the yellow walls, making the entire room seem orange. Almost seemed like they were on the inside of the sun. The room was crammed full with things, old things like posters of basketball players and crazy looking uh, wedgie shorts, a faded calendar on the wall from 1985, back to the future theme, a dresser with navy blue paint peeling off like the skin on someone's nose after they've been in the sun too long. There were also some medals and ribbons there, a folded up flag and a small red truck, an old school fire engine on top of the dress. 
Jenny hopped off the bed for a better look. Watch for Splendor son, his mother warned, as he walked over the camping, putting snakes to the dresser. The red trunk, he realized, was a model, and the details, the ladder, the side mirrors, perfect. Even better than he could. Dang. He left his models back home, and Ma had just brought him two new ones, especially for this trip. Double dang. He just reached out to pick up the red truck when Grandma yelled from downstairs, rise and shine, babies. Breakfast is ready. The boys and their mother followed the smell of food down the shady wooden steps to the kitchen doorway. Grandma was standing over the stove, flipping bacon, bacon with the fork. The grease popped every time she poked the bacon, but she never flinched. An old man, Grandpa, sat at the round kitchen table. He had on a white dress shirt with the sleeves rolled up and like Ernie, dark sunglasses. His face had that look old men get when they shaved the day before and the beard was just starting to grow back. White specks of dust all over his cheeks. Come in here and say hi to your grandfather. Grandma said sitting the fork on the counter and stirring something in a copper pot. She nodded to Jenny, then at the empty chair to the right of the old man for Jenny to sit in. Ernie sat in the one across from him. Ma sat next to Ernie, completing the circuit. Ernie spoke first. Hi, Grandpa. Ernie, the almost Birthday boy, Grandpa Green, holding up a huge hand. Been a month, a Sunday son, long time no see. Jenny wasn't sure what a month of Sunday meant, but figured Ernie must have known because he reached a hand out and gave Grandpa a five. That voice, Jenny recognized it too. Also from the phone calls, Grandpa was the one who would always ask if Jenny was taking care of his father which made it seem to Jenny that his grandparents expected him to take care of everybody. <laughs> Ernie nudged Jenny, urging him to speak. How Jenny said softly. Jenny, Grandpa put his hand out again. Nice to finally meet you. Jenny went to give him five, but Grandpa caught his hand, grabbed down on it like a mouse trap on a mouse, and shook it hard and tight tight enough to make one of Jenny's eyes close up, tight enough to almost make him ask, what's your problem? The first one is always like this, Grandpa leaned in close enough for Jenny to smell him, a mix of sweet and sweat, and lowered his voice to almost a whistle. But now that we know each other, all the rest, is, rest will be fires. Then he grinned back. His teeth were like dad's and Ernie's, perfect, white. Speaking of dad, Jenny wondered where he was and when he was going to show up, and maybe save him from this white tooth <laughs> crazy man with grandpa still clutching his hand. Jenny peered around looking for his father. And I'm going to stop here on page 25 and let um, Jenny's read. I've been laughing there since I've been reading this book, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. I want to see what the outcome is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. You must have had lots of great laughter moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> when they first went to Virginia to their grandparents' house, their grandmother had them scooping up. Oh, um, the dog poop. <laughs> no, they were doing it on They said the oldest brother was teaching the uh, the younger one how to take, put it in the shovel and and I was oh, tossing. And the young one couldn't quite <laughs> toss and toss it the wrong way. It hit the grandmama's oh. uh, window on the house. 
Yes, I know she was upset. Yes. <laughs> All right, look. Um, so I hope I can get you the power to find out why they named it as Brave as you because somebody's going to do something brave. I, I'm assuming yeah. one of the boys in Virginia visiting the grandparents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, that's a nice book. <laughs> well, I'm going to share with you a book called Teachers Are Special. Since we are in a pandemic, I thought it would be really good to share this book by Nancy Burke. Nancy Burke is the author. Teachers are special. By Nancy Burke? Yeah, B-U-R-K-E. Okay. Nancy Burke. Yes. I guess, guess in, in one of the titles, she says, Stuff for a Good Teacher. And she lists 10 things that she borrowed from Allison, that's someone's last name, age seven, or maybe the first name, age seven. Anyway, this is what Allison said. Stop for a good teacher, loves her kids, helps you out, always has a smile, is fair with her kids, is full of surprises, takes good care of us has smart brains, tries her best, likes to laugh, <laughs> listens to her heart. I thought that was very interesting. And then Burke says something by Naomi, who is age 17 at the time of this writing. My English teacher will always have a very special place in my heart. He was there for one of my close friends when she needed comfort. He really helped her out a lot. And he helped me too at the same time because he showed me that there are still teachers who care about their students, who are willing to take time out of their busy schedules to help another person who don't think that the world revolves only around them. I thank him very much for being there for my friend and me and for showing us the real meaning of the word life. It's nice to know there are teachers who haven't forgotten what teaching and love are all about. We will be grateful to him all our lives. Again, that is Naomi, age seven, speaking about one of her favorite teachers. Then Christina says, Mr. Hardy always made school work fun. He loved to play around and make jokes, but he wouldn't play at all if you got on his bad side and didn't work. All he wanted to do was teach. And all he wanted us to do was be the best we could be. He told us if we wanted something, we would have to work very hard to get it. He told us the real world was tough, that it was hard out there. But he also said, don't let anybody tell you, you can't make it in life. You can. He would tell us that every day. He cared. That's the best kind of teacher. Then moving right along, Ryan at age eight pointed this out. My special teacher kind of acts like my mother. Like she says, if I don't eat, she'll tell on me. Maybe she's more like a sister. Anyway, I give her more kisses than anybody else. And she can be funny too. 
Like when she talks about her boyfriend, she says that he buys her diamond earrings. Yeah, right. That's Ryan, age eight. My mom was an elementary teacher before she married and raised five daughters. In many ways, she was my favorite teacher because she always guided me in the right direction. During my rebellious teen years, my mom tried to save me from the ways of the world. She fell and I fell over to the dark side. When I matured, she welcomed me back and began teaching me again. Because of her patience, understanding, and positive view of life, I developed into a strong, functional woman, and I became a teacher myself. Thank you, Mom, for teaching, guiding, and giving me the tools to have a successful life on this earth. That's Mary H., a second grade teacher. And I will read one more. One teacher who made a big impression on me was my fifth grade teacher. When I first got to her class, I thought the work was too hard. I didn't think I'd even make it to the sixth grade. I was scared. But she taught me not to be afraid. She told me that I was an intelligent girl and all I had to do was put my mind to the work. With her, I discovered I had something I never thought I had, strength. Now I know I can do anything and be anything and I will succeed. That's Sabrina, age 15. And hopefully I can come back later and say something else within the book. Okay, very good. Yeah, do um, you have any questions, Charlie? Yeah. Not what you read? Yeah. Okay. Now who is uh, next? <laughs> It's your turn, Charlie. Okay. Okay, here we go. Right. Um. And it's a Disneyland. Remember that, Daddy. Is there all those puppets keep on singing the same song over and over over again? I smile. The world the world be a happy place to live, don't you think? Dad, look at me a real long time. Then he puts his head down on the table and he started knocking it on it on the edge. Mother pulls him up from there. They knelt in the hall and did more whisper. After a while, Mother called to me from her bedroom. bedroom. Judy B., could you pick up the phone, please? It's your grandfather. He wanted to talk to you for a minute. I pick up the phone. Hello? Hello, your li Hello yourself, little girl, says my grandpa, Frank Miller. What's up to this morning? I'm moving today, I told him. Grandpa Miller sounds upset. Moving, he said. Oh, no, you can't be moving. If you move, then you won't be able to come over to my house on Saturday. I curl up my eyebrows at him. Because this conversation smells fishy, that's why. Yeah, only how can, how can you want me to come to your house, I asked. And how how come it how come it has to be on Saturday? Because Saturday is the day I don't I I do my work around here, remember? He said, You're still my little helper, aren't you? I thought very careful. Careful. Yes, I said. 
on my account of something i have grandpa fixed up it is it's called all jobs i think are you doing all jobs i asked him is that what that's why you want me to come over there sure i'm doing all jobs said my grandpa but i can't do them without my helper can i you're the one who wears the tool belt, aren't you? I smile very proud because Grandpa Miller tool belt is the best thing I love. It's a dingle tool handle off, off that thing. It wraps around me two whole times and I don't even carry it. Just then, Grandpa Miller had made his voice real quiet. You haven't even heard the best part yet, he whispered. Guess what? I'm going to be fixing. I whispered back to him. What? Then Grandpa said for me and to hang on a little minute. On account of he wanted to close his door or else my grandma might hear. If your grandma hears, then she wants to be my helper instead of you, he said. I would it very patiently. Ready, he said. Ready, I said. Okay, I'm going to be fixing the upstairs toilet. Just then, my mouth came all the way open. <clears throat> Costly fixing the upstairs toilet is a dream come true. That's why? Aren't you going to take the lid off the top, Grandpa? And are you going to keep flushing it and flushing it? And are you going to watch all the water go down of that thing? I asked. Sure I am. Of course I am. That's half the fun thing. Fun, The fun I fixed the toilet, right? He said. Right, I said. Very excited. Plus, I saw I love that big ball and float on the top. Me too, said my grandpa. I love that the big ball too. And so I can't count on you, can I? You and I have a date on Saturday, Saturday, right? I thought some more. Yeah, only I think you're, there are something you forgot, Grandpa. What? He asked. What did I forgot, little girl? I raised my eyebrow at the silly head. You forgot that I'm moving today? Chapter five, being a busy bee. Grandpa, Grandma and Grandpa Miller take turns babysitting me before lunch. Then they gets me dressed for kindergarten except for today. Mother came home from work and then she got me dressed instead. She said she would drive me to school and if, and if I drive, and if I drive you, then you won't have to see Jim on the bus. She said, very thoughtful. You got out my clothes for school? It's, it was my jumper with the frogs on it. Yeah, only guess. I, I'm not even wearing school clothes today. On account, I'm, uh, uh, I'm moving. And so I have to wear moving man clothes. Mother kept on trying to put the jumper on me. That's how come I made my legs and arms real stuffy. So they would fix it, fix in there that good. Then me and mother wrestled and teen a tiny bit. And she stood me on my head and she pulled my tights on me. We're not moving, Judy B, she said. You're going to school and that's final. Run away from your problems and never solve anything. Yeah, only I'm not even running, I said. I'm calling Ruby rent trucks and those guys will drive me. Mother smiled. She tried to hug me, but I kept staying real stuff. I stay real stuff all the way in the car to school. Mother parked the car in the parking lot. Then she lift me out the door and she carried me real slow to the playground. She stood me up in the grass. Everything would be fine, she, you see. 
She said, just remember your dad and I told you. If anyone talks about the party, pretend it doesn't bother you. She kissed me goodbye in my stuffy head. Just then I heard a voice. Judy B! Hey, Judy B! Look! Look what we got! There. Yeah, I turned around. It was my best friend, Lucy and that Grace. They were running to me. Look! said Lucy, look what Jim gave us an invitation to his birthday party on Saturday. It's just like he told us, Judy B, said that Grace. He really got, he really got to have a pet thing zoo there. I quickly covered my ears and with my hands. Then I closed my eyes and sang a loud song at them. It is called, I Can't Hear You, You're Not Even Bothering Me. Sang it at the top of my lungs. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You're nothing. You're not even bothering me. Then I kept on singing and singing that thing until they went away. Also, they did the choco choco sign at me. After that, I sat down in the grass all by myself, and I looked all around the the playground. Lots of children had invitations to. Darn it, I whispered. Darn it, darn it, darn it. That, that's when I saw the mean Jim. He was giving an invitation, invitation to a boy named Crybaby William. Crybaby William is a scariest cat in the in room nine. He even scared a teeny tiny fleas, I think. Just that I said a little bit strange. Because I just got another idea in my head, that's why. It was called, hey, maybe I could take William's invitation away from him because he won't even chase me, probably. And so then I will have my very own invitation and Will can get another one that from that gym. And everybody will get to go to the party, including me. I stood up from the grass. Then I spooled my eyes and cried, baby, when, and I started to run at him very slow. I ran faster and faster until finally I was running and I, as fast as a speed bumblebee. bumblebee. I buzzed all around William, simply quit. His eyes couldn't even follow me that good. Then I buzzed around in his face and I quickly grabbed the impetus of his hand and I ran my and I ran my fast to the swing set. And guess what? William didn't even follow me. That's what. And here's more good news. William invitation didn't even have his name on it. So that means it, it's probably for anybody, anybody probably. Now it's now it's mine, I said, because I will put my name on it when I get to room nine, and it will be my very own invitation. Just then the bell rang for school, I put my invitation away down in my deep pocket and skipped very happy to my class. Mrs. was standing outside of room nine. We was standing with her. His nose was stuffed a real lot. I tried to skip past them, but Miss Grab the stub of my frog jumper. She pulled me back. You know, only I don't actually think that it's good for the outfit, I said. Mrs. did a frown. Judy B, did you take something that belongs to William? She asked. No, I said, because his name wasn't even on it. And so that means it is for anybody, I think. Mrs. Trap her angle foot. What was William holding? What's William holding an invitation, Judy B? And did you snatch it out of his hand? And then did you run away from him? He asked. I smiled very cute. I was a please a bit. I said, Mrs. Hold out her hand. Maybe I'll have it, please. She asked. May I have the invitation you took for William? I rocked back and forth with my feet because I didn't want to give it to her. That's why. Yeah, only I think it might bounce out my pocket. I said, Mrs. Blend down next to me 
She then right into my face. I want the invitation, she said. Now I go. Wow. Then I quick pick my I quick put my hand in my pocket. Good news. I found it. I said very nervously. Give it to William, said Mrs. Crabbe will put out his hand and shove it. it Shove it, it at him. Here, Mr. Stinky Head, Turtle Boy. I said, here, your Stinky Head invitation. Mrs. I, Mrs. I got real big. Judy B. Jones, that quick. Enough. Now you go sit down. And I don't want to hear another word. Do you understand me, young lady? And no more words. And so that's how come I walk ever slipping in my seat. And I put my head on the table. Cause guess what? Cause guess what? Laying low again, that's why. Chapter six. Mrs. Mrs. took attention. The attendance. And attendance is when you say, I'm here, except you're not here. You have to be quiet. Also, we have a pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. That is called opening considered, I think. After that, we sat down and Mrs. passed out our novel. She told us that to turn the page. It was work about different kind of. Shapes like, shapes like circle and squares and triangles. I am breezed at that stuff. Only I could even count very good on my own account if I kept daydreaming about that birthday party. Daydreaming is just like my night dreaming. Only it's not night and you're not fast asleep and you're not dreaming. I kept on thinking about how everyone was going to the party, only not me. I was the only one in all of room nine. I was just seeing girls were going were going to. I thought it was just myself, cause that would be nice for for them. After a while, I trap, I tap on Lucy. You are my best good friend. I told her. Lucy smiled at me. You are my best good friend too. She said. I touched her new dress. She looked my. She looked very precious today. I said. You look very precious today, I said. Lucy stuffed her head. Thank you. You look very precious today, too, she said back. I touch her fingernails with polish on them. I wish I wish you and me would be twins, I said. Me, too. I wish you and me could be twins, too, she said. Just then, my whole face got happy. Lucy, Lucy, I just thought of something. You and me are pretend we are twins and we can do everything just the same and so on saturday we saturday we can come to my house and i will put fingernail polish on my nails and just like you and you will stay home from that birthday party just like me Lucy didn't say anything bad. I tapped on her. How come you're not talking, twin? I said, how come you're not saying anything bad? Because I want to go to the party. That's what I said, Lucy. I did hustle, breathe at her. Yes, Lucy, I know you want to go to the party, but now you and me are twins, and twins have to do everything just the same. And so, if I don't want to go to the party, then you can't go to the party, too. On account of that, the twin rule. No, it's not, said Lucy. My cousins are twins. And one is, and one is a boy, and one is a girl. And they don't do anything alike. I draw from my hair, yeah. Only that is not the kind of twin I want to be, Maddie. I yell. Mrs. Snap her fingers out at me. Sit down, she yelled. Just then, that Jimmy I hate turned around at his chair and laughed real mean at me because I was in trouble. Turn around your fatty head. 
I said. Only if he then turned it around and saw that, how come I didn't run to his table? And I turned around to him. Judy B. Jones, shouted Miss. What are you doing? I am turning around his fat head, I explained. Mrs. Hurry, Mrs. Hurry to where I was. Then she quick took my arm and we and she marched me into the hall. She pointed at principal's office. Go, she said real angrily. I did a group. Yeah, only I'm not actually supposed to go there. Sorry about that. That was my auntie. Then she quickly took my arm and marched me into the ball. She pointed at the principal's office. Go, she said real angrily. I go. Yeah, only I'm not actually supposed to go there anymore, I said, because me and mother had to talk about it, and she said for me not to get sent there again. Mrs. Face got red as a tomato. She started counting count numbers. One, two, three, four. And so that's how come I hurry up and walk, because teachers who count numbers are our scaring kind of there is. So I'm gonna stop right there because next next is chapter seven. That is my story. My story this time by Judy B. Jones. I will start on that. On. Can you give us an update of what you was uh reading? Because the first two chapters was about the party, and then chapter three, you mentioned the party again, and then you mentioned the two best friends talking. Did you hear what Charlie said? Oh, shoot. I guess you'll uh, come back in. So I think it's my turn to read after her, right? But you read after me. Right, it's your turn. Okay. And I'm on page uh, 25. Leave that boy alone, Brooke, Grandma said, snapping the old man on the shoulder, setting a plate full of breakfast food in front of him. Grandpa released his grip, and Jeannie happened to finally have his hand back, massaged his fingers. Grandpa must have noticed Jeannie's nervousness because she asked, Who are you looking for, your daddy? He outside. He'll be back in a second. She kissed Grandpa on the cheek and dodged him as he squatted at her. But on her way back to the counter for another plate. Her silver hair was wound into a bun on top of her head, and her flowered nightdress was much prettier in the daytime. So was she. The next plate was Jenny's, eggs, bacon, toast, and some grubby white stuff that must have come from that pot Grandma had been stirring. Looked like <laughs> food, prison food. <laughs> Grandma being <laughs> how you boys like grits? My lamb. They don't know what grits are. <laughs> Mama Harris, 
but they're going to try some today. Jenny stuck his fork into the white slime and hoped it didn't taste like peas. Peas were the one thing he hated to eat more than anything. This stuff wasn't green, so that was a good sign. He let the gritty goo slip between the th tines of the fork and pop back down onto his plate. He looked at his brother. Ernest seemed just as worried, but lifted the fork straight to his mouth and tasted it anyway. Ernie was brave like this. He made a face like the white stuff the grits was good, so Jenny tried it too. Tastes like sand, Jenny blurted. Not quite wanting to spit it out, but not wanting to swallow it either. He just wanted to let it sit there in his mouth until it dissolved. Jenny, Ma hated when he said stuff like that. At the time, she was always after him to tell the truth. And the truth was to him, the Grinch tasted like he was even saying, <laughs> say it. <laughs> this is a teacher. <laughs> Look in the moon. <laughs> well, I got something for that. He pushed his chair back just as Grandma finally sat down and went over to the county where there were three coffee cans. Popping the top off the middle one. <laughs> stuck his fingers in it, then closed it back up. He returned to the table and sprinkled something on top of Jenny's grid. Try now. What was it? Jenny asked word. Magic dust. Grandpa grinned. A little less creepy this time and sat back down. Try it. Jenny picked his fork up and touched it to his tongue just enough to see Sugar? And yeah, now the grits were so much better. Grandma was looking intently at Jenny, but her head, head tilted like she was trying to figure something out. <laughs> you know what else? Didn't, who, else who else didn't like grits unless they had sugar on them? She asked. Uh-huh. Good. Grandpa said. He'd been stabbing his eggs with his fork, but stopped suddenly as if eating was getting in the way of thinking. Whoa, that's something, ain't it? Uncle Wood, Jenny piped in. Eat your breakfast, his mother commanded. Your grandfather got it all sugared up for you. Please don't have my son's teeth riding by the end of the summer. <laughs> A new voice in the room, Dad's. He appeared out of nowhere. Walking over to the table, he kissed Jenny on the forehead. Mm -hmm. Then Ernie, then Grandma. He leaned in and just grazed Mom's cheek with his lips awkwardly. It was friendly, but not loving. But it was better than what Grandpa got, which was no kiss at all. <laughs> Your place on the counter. But wash your hands before you eat, Grandma said. Low, as if Dad was still a little boy. Been out there fooling with the dirty dog. What you talking about? Rotten tea. Grandpa said on top of Grandma telling Dad to wash her. Please. You ate more sugar than any kid in his in history. And you still got pearly whites don't you? Just one cabin your entire life. Dad didn't respond. Just rest his hand in the kitchen seat. Grandpa started to pile his eggs on his toes. Grits on top of that. Topping it all with a slice of bacon. My glance at Dad, Dad uneasily while taking in a spoonful of grits herself. Ernie, after watching Grandpa 
construct his breakfast tower, did the same thing. He and repeat. That made Jitty wonder if Ernie got the idea of wearing sunglasses in the house for from Grandpa too. Dad dried his hands on a towel hanging from the other door and stayed standing. There wasn't enough chairs at the small table, but it didn't seem like he wanted to sit down anyway. When Grandpa offered Dad his, Dad refused and ate at the counter. So Mama, he said, why don't you let me put some money into fixing up this place? The floor upstairs is all walked and the planks must have shrunk. They're all spaced out. I can't see straight. I can see straight to the living room. Don't need no fixing sign, Grandpa answered before Grandma get, could get a word out. My blood and sweat is in this house, built it with my own two hands. I'm just getting old, just like me. But it's still standing, just like me. Grandpa lifted the breakfast towel to his mouth and smirked. And just like you. Dad rolled his eyes and Grandma chimed in. Ernest, huh, that's sweet. But you saved that money for these boys. And Jamaica, okay. You fly out. What? Two weeks, right? Yeah. And I'm so grateful that you could take the boys for so long. This was the only time we could get them down here, especially with Ernie having to pick up extra shifts so he could take off two whole weeks. Ma was saying apologetically when Grandma waved her apology away, her eyes brighter. Oh, baby, this is no problem. Happy to have her, she insisted. Dad just sat down on his bottom. I'm sorry. Dad just bent down on his bottom lip and glared at his father before turning back to his food. Jenny, however, was fixated on Grandpa, on his face, especially shades. Every few bites, Jenny would look up and see his own reflection in the sunglasses. Then he would look back down at his plate embarrassed for staring, <laughs> but he just couldn't help it. What is it, Jenny? Grandpa asked at last. Tower demolished, plate clean. He took a slurp of his coffee from a white mug and set it black letters. They said it black letters. Virginia is for lovers. Hearts replacing all these. Huh. What is it? You keep staring at me. I told you. We know each other now. After their handshake. So that means you can tell me anything. He took another slurp. Swallowed. So spill. Now everyone. Was staring at Jenny. Except for Ernie was too busy trying to pile everything left on his plate on the last piece of toast. Ma nodded, which meant it was okay for Jen to say whatever it was he wanted to say. Huh, she started nervous. Well, it's just that Jenny looked at his mother one more time just to make sure, nodded again. It's just that Ma always says, you shouldn't wear sunglasses in the house. She says it makes your eyes go bad. Plus, it makes you look crazy. <laughs> His mother popped up for him. His mother snorted. Um, she started to meet and apologize. Grandpa cut off. Well, he stated, your ma is a small woman. But for me, it's different. He wiped his mouth with a napkin, then balled it up and dropped it on the table. Want to know why? Why, Jenny asked. Grandpa leaned being close again. This time, enough for Jenny to get a whiff of the coffee on, coffee on his breath. 
because I already can't see a thing. And I've been crazy for years. <laughs> Okay, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm now I'm on page uh, 32, which is chapter 2. You still with me, Talia? With us? Yes, ma'am. I had to leave because I couldn't hear at first. Okay, then. Yeah. Okay, um, oh, uh, Janice, you, you next. Then, Talia, you have for Janice. <laughs> okay, I will share some more. Uh, Teachers are special by Nancy Burke. Okay. Nobody can be taught faster than he can learn. Every man that has ever undertaken to instruct others can tell what slow advances he has been able to make and how much patience it requires to recall vagrant inattention, to stimulate sluggish indifference and to rectify absurd misapprehension. That's a quote that comes from the famous Samuel Johnson, English writer and critic. The teacher should never lose his temper in the presence of the class. If a man, he may take refuge in profane soliloquies. If a woman, she may follow the example of one sweet faced and apparently tranquil girl and go out in the yard and gnaw a post. William Lyon Phelps, professor of English, Yale University. I am writing this letter about my favorite teacher, Miss Johnson. She is my fifth grade teacher. She is wonderful. She is inspiring. She is great. When we don't understand something, she will keep teaching and teaching and teaching until we get it. I don't think any of my teachers has done that before. She is also very neat and organized. Everything has its place. The room is never a mess. All my other teachers were very unorganized. My mom says, she likes Miss Johnson too, because this year, I really understand what's being taught. I want everyone to know how wonderful Miss Johnson really is. That's age 11, Lauren. Education is hanging around until you caught on. Robert Frost, American poet made that statement. I am writing this to show my appreciation to my second grade teacher. She helped me learn math, English, and spelling. And she was able to teach me things when no one else could. No one has ever gone that far to help me learn something. And I will always love her for it. Bobby, age 11. Know then thyself. Presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. Placed on this isthmus of a little state, a being darkly wise and rudely great, with too much knowledge, for the skeptic inside, with too much weakness for the stoic's pride, he hangs between, in doubt to act or rest, in doubt to deem himself a god or beast, in doubt his mind or body to prefer, 
born but to die, and reasoning but to err, alike in ignorance, his reason such, whether he thinks too little or too much. Alexander Pope, English poet. My special teacher is my boyfriend. The reason why I feel that way is because when I don't understand something, he tries so hard to help me understand. And he definitely encourages me about school. He makes sure that I go. He's very smart and he gives me good advice and he never leads me in the wrong direction. He may have made a mistake in dropping out of school, but he will never ever let me do the same. He knows he made a mistake and he doesn't want that to happen to me. All he wants for me is the best. Simone, age 17. My best teacher was Mrs. A. I was lucky because I had her in kindergarten, second grade, fourth grade, and sixth grade. The thing that was special about her was she helped me with love and with understanding. Not like this other teacher I had who used to hit me on my head so much that I would go home with big headaches. She finally stopped hitting me when I said I was going to tell the principal. Then she told me she only hit me so that I would learn. Mrs. A was different. She was always trying to get to know us better. And if you had a problem, she was always there for you. Now, that's a real teacher. This comes from Ainita, age 15. My teacher is fun and hardworking and never forgets to take time to talk to her students. Unlike some teachers who only teach and never talk. And she has nicknames for all of us. She calls me sugar lips. Of course, she is a little absent-minded, but that usually means she forgets when reports are due, which is okay. That's Sarah, age 11. Some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few are to be chewed and digested. Francis Bacon, English philosopher and essayist. If you cannot read all your books, at any rate, handle them and as it were, fondle them. Let them fall open where they will. Make a voyage of discovery, taking soundings of uncharted seas. Sir Winston Churchill, British statesperson and author. I didn't really have any special teacher until this year. Then I met some teachers who really care about their students. You see, I had my son when I was 15 years old. And it was hard for me because even though I wanted to go to school, I didn't have a babysitter. So I was absent a lot. I still did my work. I was determined that I wasn't going to let anyone or anything keep me from my education. But even though I did my work, because I was absent so much, my teachers weren't supposed to pass me. They did anyway. I'll never forget them. And I thank them all. On Hackett, age 16. 
The teacher that was most special to me was my seventh grade teacher. She was strict, but very understanding and very nice. Everybody paid attention to her, even the troublemakers in the class. And she once told me something that I would never forget. She told me that knowledge is power. Other people had told me that before. But the way she said it made me realize that she and everyone who had ever told me that was right. I will always love her for that. Rosa, age 16. Finally, lives of great men remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, American Poet. Again, this book is a tribute to those who educate, encourage, and inspire. Entitled, Teachers Are Very Special. Nancy Burke is the author, and I have enjoyed reading it. Thank you. And you were talking about uh, teachers and the influence of teachers. And uh, since I'm up in age, <laughs> Oh, I won't go back to my <laughs> long way to go. <laughs> but I won't go. I'm gonna go. go with that. Child Dad, I want Nobody you to tell us about, about some of your <laughs> uh, child Dad, I want you to tell us about some of your special teachers that they employed. I, I want to just mention I want to go back to college 30 some years ago. But anyway, um my history teacher, let me write a paper on Billy Holiday and, and uh, that was my beginning of writing something in my field which was legal administration you know to be a paralegal that I really uh, liked it doing the research and writing about and now I'm working on the research to turn it into a book so in terms of teachers and influence, um, I think that there's so many th what things, teachers that I could, all of my teachers at Utica Junior College were to me the best and the greatest. They did not allow us to bark in the book, to bend mm -hmm. the pages. Uh, uh, everything was about clay. You know, it's, uh, and um, all of the administration was, was was black. People looked like me, and uh, and they had love and tough love, and and I think that's uh, mm -hmm. very valuable in this life. So Thailand, so she read all these stories about teachers and and how special they are to people. Tell us a few of the teachers that influenced you and were special to you. You're, you're going to sixth grade now, right? I'm going to fifth. Okay, you, you're going to, to the uh, fifth. So you've had six years of school. So you got a lot of stories, a lot of different teachers, right? <laughs> so give us some of the special ones. <laughs> well, my special teacher was um, my third grade teacher. Her name was Karen um, Rogers. She was she loved she loved when we um do math, read it, everything like in a group. Like some things like when we talk about like we what we did yesterday and then we actually do it today and how other kids explain what they had to do for their prompts. Like she like every morning she let us do prompts. Like what would you do if what would you do for the summer? What would you do? If you had no teachers at a school, 
and all things like that. But one thing that made, well, a lot of things that made her special to me that she's kind, she's beautiful. She's really don't have to fuss at a lot of kids like my kindergarten, my kindergarten teacher used to do. Because I'll say my kindergarten, she really didn't like me because I was a good A straight student when I was little. But when I got to more higher grades, she left. Then my fourth grade teacher, her name was Miss Kindred. She was very funny, very silly. She got a funny daughter. She has three girls, one named um, Geneva, and I forgot the other two. But they Owens. But they very what the. the her little daughter is very special to me because every time that I come to class, she don't want to hug the other students, but she loves hugging me. And sometimes she always bring me gifts. Oh, that was nice. So how old is her daughter? Um, six. Oh, and she used to be in the classroom with her? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so anyway, uh, yeah, since I... When she was reading about the students uh, and the um, and their special teachers, I just thought of a couple that I was just wondering. Now, uh, U.S. Thanks for sharing that. And it's actually your time to read. What page are you on now? Um, I'm done with chapter six, but I was gonna go ahead and go to chapter seven. What's the name of chapter seven? My story, my story this time by Judy B. Jones. And so all of these stories that you are reading about Judy B. Jones and, and Jim, what's the name of the characters in these stories? Um, Jim, Lucy, wait, it's Mrs. Um, Judy B. Jones, Rachel Lucy, that Grace. Mean Jim, Crybaby William, Paula Al, Paula Adam, Adams, John LaHall, Robinson, Robbie, Charlotte, and Lucy. Those are all the character names in Judy B. Jones. And okay. I wanted to read another story called Trouble at Table 5. But I think I have to read that probably like next week because this is kind of like a chapter book too. Oh, it's a chapter book. Okay. And and what's the name of uh chapter seven? I'm gonna type it in the chat. My story, my story this time by Judy B. Jones. My story big time. My story this time. My story this time. That's the name of the chapter. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Principal is the boss of the school. He lives at the office. I have to go there when I'm unruly. Unruly is the school word for not being rude. Ruly. There is a typing, lady, typing lady there. She isn't allowed to smile. She sit down. She said. She point at the blue chair. Yeah, only I don't actually like to sit there. Remember that, because that is, is where the bad kids sit. And I am not even bad. I explain. I explain that to her every time I go there. The type of lady leans over the counter at me, and she made her face look scary at me. Sit down she said i sat down and i pulled my frog jumper over my face nobody could see me pull your shirt back down she put down back down said the typing lady yeah only i'm actually allowed to this allowed to do this because i have i have tights on i said see them they are green like tail 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 poles on them. Just then, I heard principal voice. Well, well, Judy B. Jones. What a surprise, he said. My mouth dropped all the way open. Hey, I yelled from under my dress. 
How did you know it's me on the, under here? Because you can't see my face. Look again, said Principal. That after, I uncovered my head and me and him went in his office. I climbed up in the big wooden chair. Principal looked very tiredish. He's is rubbed the side of his baldy head. Okay, let's hear it. What's your story this time? He said. I sat I sat up straight and tall. My story this time by Judy B. Jones. Once upon a time, I didn't get invited to a mean boy birthday party, and I'm and I'm the only one in the in the night room the night room nine who isn't going, and so that's how come I am moving today. Only mother bought me a a school. Me to, brought me to school, very stuff, and then I was a visibly. Only Crybaby Will is a squiggler, and Lucy won't be a good twin. And so Miss, so then Miss yelled at me, and that how come I had twisted that Jim's head, and now I'm sitting here in this big wooden chair. I folded my hands on on my lap. The end. Principal put his head down on his desk. I peeked at him. Are you lying low? I whispered. He sat up again. Then he called my mother on the telephone. Those who talk very often. This time they talk about the birthday party and how I was not invited. After he hung up, Principal looked nicer at me. I guess sometimes we grow, we grow, grown ups think that we're the only ones with problems. He said. We forget that even when your little life can be tough, it can't, Judy B. Jones. Yes, I said, life can be the, your goat. After that, me and him went out of his office and he lifted me into the blue chair again. I want you to wait here for a minute, he said. There's someone I have to talk to before I get this settled. Yeah, only guess what? I really, I don't actually want to sit in this chair, I explained. On account of this is where the bad kids sit, and I am not even bad. Principal thought and thought. Then he snapped his fingers. I think I might have the perfect solution, he said. He went in his office and bought a giant shopping bag. <laughs> what if we hide under here? He asked, if we hide under here this bag, no one will be able to see you at all. I jump up and down, very excited. Cause Ka hanging, and my favorite thing is the w w whole world, that's why. Right. Principal sat me down in the chair. He put the giant shopping bag over my head. Hey, who, who turned out the lights, I said. And I laughed and I laughed, because that is called comedy of of course i bend my knees and pull them under the bag hug them real tight and now all you can see is the is my tippy my tippy toes of my shoes i said very happy this is per this is a perfect solution i ever saw and so how did you even think of Wonderful things I asked. Only principal did not answer me back. Because he probably went back to his office already. After that, I hide and hide inside my bag. I hide a real long time. It was a zillion years, I think. Guess what? It is time. It, it, this is taking longer than a minute. I said, from inside there, the type of lady didn't answer me. Yeah, only guess what else? My knees are... My knees are bent and squished in there, in here, I said. And so this isn't good for my circle, circle probably, probably. Just then my legs start squirreling all around because I was getting ants in my pants, that's why. Hey, does anybody have ears? Get me out of here right now because I, I am at the end of my rope. And it is tight. Please, plus also, I'm getting ants in my. All of a sudden, someone yanked 
the bag right off my head. And it was the scariest type of lady. Pants, I said very softly. She took me back to the principal's office. And guess what? That Jim was in there. He was sitting in the big one chair. And the principal was frowning at him. Judy B., our friend Jim, here has something he wants to say to you. Don't you, Jim, ex-principal, the mean Jim didn't answer. He kept on looking at his feet. Principal tapped his, tapped his finger. We're waiting, Jim, he said. Then Jim did a huff breathing, and he said the word, I'm sorry. Principal raised up his eyebrow. Sorry for what, Jim? Tell Judy B. what you're sorry for. That Jim stared at his feet some more. I'm sorry that I didn't invite you to my party, he said very grumpily. But your mother told you to. But your mother told you. Didn't she, Jim? She said, your mother told you to give an invitation to every single person in your class. But you got mad at Judy B and you decided not to give it. Give her one. Isn't that right, that mean boy? Did his shoulders up and down? I guess, he said real soft. Principal crossed his arms. And so what are you doing to do? What? And so what are you going to do to the correct the problem, he said. What Jim waited, that Jim waited and waited. Then all of a sudden, he goes down from his chair and holds out an invitation to me. My stomach did a flip-flop for me and flip-flop for me. And is that really for me? I said, very swiftly. Then I snatched that thing right out of his hand and I zoomed all around the room. Oh boy, I said, it's, it's really for me? It's really for me? And so now I'm not the only one. I zoom all around the big room chair. Principal looked nervous of me. He hurried up and opened his door. Then I zoomed right out of there. And I didn't stop until I got to room nine. Number eight, ruining my Saturday. On Saturday, mother woke me up from sleep. We have to go to the store and buy Jim a present, she said. I did a sleeping on. Yeah, and I didn't actually like that, boy, but I explained. And so you can go by yourself. And I will trust your judge, and I'll pull the cover over my head. Mother pulled them off again. Then she made me get dressed, and she made me eat a banana. And she made me go to the store with her. She held my hand and pulled me behind her. Since we don't know what he already has, let's get some things usual, she said. Let's get him greedy penny grass gummy gummies. That is unusual, I said. Mother had a sick face. She pulled me through the store and she went past the ba the bathroom stuff. I pointed, that, let, let's get him that, I said. That is usual. Mother stuck, mother stuck in her cheek. We're not getting him a, a toilet brush, she said. She pulled, she pulled me past the pet store. That. Let's get him that, I said. That is unusual. But mother said, no, no, choke chain. Just, just then she pulled me past the tools that when my eyes dropped right of my head. That, let's get that. Let's get him that. Look, mother, look, I love that thing. I, I remember to speed quickly. It's a tool belt, see? It's just like Grandpa Miller, only it made from little children like me. See, Mother? See, this is a wonderful thing. Mother took it down off the shelf. Well, look, I said it's a hammer and it's screwdriver and some pluckers and a flashlight and a really actually double with a bubble in it. Plus, also, there's a pocket with little... Oopsie. Little pretend nails in the front. I jump all 
around. Can I try it on? Can I? Please, mother. Please, please. Mother shook her head. No. We're not shopping for you today. Judy B, we're shopping. Judy B, we're shopping for Jim, remember? I know it, but I know we're shopping for that Jim. I, I said. And so this can be for his birthday. Only first I have to try it on to see if it fits. Because him and me are both the same size, I bet. Finally, mother fetched the tool belt on me. Oh, it's it has a bottle? I said, I love this. I love this sticky stuff. Can we buy it, please, mother? Can we buy it and, and take it home to my house? Mother thought and thought, I don't know, Judy B. Some. Something tells me this is a good idea. I am afraid you want to keep it. No, I won't. No, I want to. No, I want to keep it. I promise, mother. I promise. I promise. And so finally, my mother gave it to me and bought a wonderful tool of them. It, it held it on my lap all the way home in the car. Then I wrapped it and I run to the house and I put and I zoomed to my room and I put the thing on me again. Now I can do odd jobs. I said real thoroughly. I took the hammer and tapped it on my wall. Then I screw, then I screw and screw with the screwdriver. Plus I saw I twist my teddy nose off with the pleaser. Only I actually didn't mean to do it. Oh, I clapped his head. I didn't know. Breathe through your nose, I said. Just then mother voice yelled to me. Judy B, it's time to take your bath, honey. I did a frown because mother was a little mixed up, I think. I yelled back. Yeah, only I don't even have to take a bath today on account today is Saturday and Saturday is my dirty day. Mother came in my room. I know today is Saturday, Judy B, she said, but you're going to a birthday party and 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 we we have you yeah, and when you go to a birthday party, you have to take a bath. Plus you're going to wash and curl your hair. I'm back up from her. No, I said, because nobody explained that to before. And so that doesn't mean make sense on account of I hate that mean kid. So now come, I have to clean for I have to get it clean for him. Mother looks at the end of the road. When you go to a party, you take a bath. And of a discussion, she said. Then she left my room and she went to start the start the tub. I sat on my bed very gumpily. Darn it, I said, because that stupid boy is ruining my whole entire Saturday. Mother yelled some more. Judy B, could you bring me the tool belt, please? I need to get it wrapped. Darn it, I said again. Because I didn't even want to give it to him. I looked down at it and I touched all the wonderful tools. It loves the darn things I said really sad. I'm waiting, shouted mom. But I still didn't take it to her. Just then I heard the bath water turned off. My heart got very pumped. Oh no, I said, because now she's going to come get me and she'll take my tool belt away. She will wrap it up for the mean guy. I jumped off my bed and ran around my room. I gotta hide, I gotta hide. I ran all over everywhere. Darn it, because there's no even a good hiding spot in this dumb room. I said, Judy B, mother screamed. I heard her feet. There, there were coming, there were coming coming for me I think oh no I said oh no oh no then I a son I quickly grabbed my wonderful tool belt and I zoomed out my room and I tried to nail things shut in my hammer next I have chapter nine the only one in, 
in room nine. And I'll probably read that tomorrow. Ooh, that is a long book. Yeah, so in the in the story of uh, Jenny always were always refers to Jim as mini Jim. Was that what else I know him not inviting her to the birthday party was me, but what else me did Jim do? Um, not invite, not invited her because after because Jim mother told told him to give every single person invitation, but he didn't want to give Judy B an invitation because Judy B didn't really do nothing at all. She was just on the bus, talk to her friend that grace, and then he just stand up and turn his head and just start saying mean stuff to her. Oh, he was bullying her on the bus. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Because I noticed that. Oh, uh, so Jen, Jenny B is the one narrating the story. Yes, ma'am. And every time she mentions Jim, she always uses mean Jim in front of the Jim. Okay, so I I get it. He. Uh, so maybe in chapter nine we'll have a happy ending. Huh? <laughs> you got one more chapter. <laughs> Okay, then so um uh, actually we we're at the end end of our time. So uh you both can uh make a uh, a comment about any of the stories before we uh close out this session. And Talia, thank you for reading with us. And I'm I'm especially happy that you're reading with us because we started learning tree book club. When you were five, and now you're eleven, and you read so well. Um, and um, uh, Doctor Vincent was saying how talented you are. You know, people get paid to use their voice to read and movies and read audio books, and you just never know what you where you gonna go with uh, with all this talent and that is a uh, emerging uh, or Tally Ann Hines, who is eleven years old. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for uh for coming and being a part of everything we do, uh, Janice. We appreciate you. Oh, I just love it. Thank you so much. I'm I'm just really happy to see the encouraged child move forward. I can remember when I first saw her and heard her read. And for some reason today, I noticed something I had not really noticed before. So I could tell that there is growth and there is much growth, I believe, if you continue, and I have no doubt to think that you won't, Talian, that you will do quite well. And you will be able to cheer many other people, just as you have cheered Miss, Mrs. McGee and me today. It's just wonderful to be part of this. And I really feel honored just knowing that you have moved on. And I noticed you are determined to continue <laughs> to move on. So that's even more exciting to me because I could feel the characters as you were bringing them to life by the way you were telling the story. So that was just remarkable. And thank you for that. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, so tomorrow I'll be on page 32 and I finally made it to chapter two in, in the book that I'm uh, reading and we don't know who will be reading with us tomorrow and uh uh and this is all perfect we had three readers and uh if we have five tomorrow or six it doesn't matter uh we're i think uh we're, we're just gonna be rewarded for all of the stories that we're learning young and old for one another and thank you all and you all have a wonderful rest of the evening thank you you too <laughs> okay. all right then bye bye yeah. <laughs>